Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. If not, please protest. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank the, um, the organizers for inviting me to give a presentation here on recent results related to the star, to the host star um, of planetary systems. So I'm going to talk about conditions for habitability, young stars and, and their environments. Here is approximately what I would like to talk about. This is, of course, not a complete view of host stars. But I want to emphasize rotation and activity, as you will see. Uh, surprisingly, this matters a lot. I want to talk a little bit about effects of on primordial hydrogen atmospheres, very young planetary systems are a concern here. Then also about non-thermal atmospheric loss. And finally, I want to say something about M dwarfs and planets around M dwarfs, especially habitable planets. So as an introduction briefly, as you sure all know, stars evolve in terms of magnetic fields, magnetic activity, you see that in the top row. As time proceeds, magnetic activity declines. That has to do with rotation of the star. Stars spin down because they have a wind. And about that, uh, the, about this science, I'm not saying much because the next speaker, Teresa Lüftinger, is going to discuss magnetic fields of stars and their evolution extensively. So I'm not saying much about this. But as a consequence of magnetic activity or magnetic fields, we have a lot of stellar output that is related to magnetic activity, such as X-rays, extreme ultraviolet winds, and a lot more particle events, coronal mass ejections, and so on and so forth, and also those decline with time. And these things have an important influence on planetary atmospheres, as we will see. So it's important to understand this um, this connection between magnetic fields, rotation, evolution, and finally the influence on, on atmospheres of planets. The motivation is here. Um, you see here X-rays or EUV, extreme ultraviolet from stars. This should actually rotate. See a solar picture here, a movie. And uh, as we know, EUV and X-ray emission influences upper atmospheres of planets. You see here calculated profiles, altitude, temperature. You see how the profiles look like for an irradiation of a very simple-minded atmosphere, two times the solar irradiation, 10 times, 20 times, and you see how the profiles get hotter and hotter. And eventually you begin to lose the upper atmospheres because it simply evaporates. A second class of uh, mass loss processes has to do with the wind, the wind of, uh, of a star. You see the solar wind here, and the winds interact with magnetospheres and upper atmospheres as well. These are the so-called non-thermal loss processes, and I'm talking a little bit about those as well. Now, let me go back about 20 or 30 years in stellar astronomy. Uh, when people started collecting properties of stars, basic properties of stellar activity, you see here one of the basic diagrams, it's a new version, but this has been known now for decades, more or less. You see the X-ray emission, you also the extreme ultraviolet uh, radiative emission, normalized by the volumetric luminosity, this is not very important at the moment, and you see on the x-axis a normalized rotation period of a star. It's actually normalized by the convective turnover time. Again, this is not very important for my discussion. Essentially, you see, as, it, as rotation increases, we have slowly rotating stars here. The activity decreases, and that has to do with the declining dynamo, the internal dynamo that produces magnetic fields, and therefore also activity. And as we go to more rapidly rotating stars, there's a break point here, and we have a constant level for more rapidly rotating stars. That's also called the saturation level. It's not very well understood why there is saturation, but it's very well empirically um, measured. Something completely different, apparently. You see here a diagram, a very classic figure. There are newer ones. I'll show you some newer ones. This is rotational velocity of a star versus age, and these are solar-like stars. It's just analogs of the sun. You see the sun here. As we go back in time to one giga year, 100 million years, the sun probably rotated more rapidly, 10 kilometers per second at the equator, and even more. 
So there's also a, re a relation here, and that has to do with the spin down, because the sun or any star loses angular momentum by a magnetized wind. There's this fuzziness here at very young ages, and I'll show you what this really means in the, in the next plot. We collected, just from the literature actually, a lot of data here, rotation periods. You can just barely read this. This is a rotation period in days, stellar mass. Uh, this is a collection of data for uh, stellar clusters of about 150 million years. You see a very wide spread of rotation periods. Contrary to what people sometimes say, like young stars rotate rapidly, that's not quite true. You see, in fact, rotation periods of 0.1 day to about 10 or 20 days at 150 million years. If you go to all the clusters, like here, 550 million years, this is a collection of data again from the literature, you see that this has completely changed. And we now get really some th sort of convergence. All rotation periods are up here at about 10 days. There's some rapidly rotating ones left over here. So there's some sort of evolution that takes place between the first and the, the second uh, picture here from 150 to 550 million years. And this is, of course, a very important age range for planetary scientists because that's when the atmospheres evolve, the initial atmospheres. Uh, how do we solve this problem? How do we describe this physically? We want to develop a model that describes this, this sort of activity evolution, uh, rotation evolution, and, and everything included. Um, this is just a short summary of a, of a paper or two papers that we recently published. Essentially, the physics that is behind it, we need to describe torques that are acting on a star by the magnetized wind mass loss. So there's a wind blowing away, takes ma magnetic fields with it, and therefore there are torques that are applied to the star. And this leads to a spin down. Now, to, to fill in here, the torque must be a function of the magnetic field strength of the mass loss rate itself and omega, the, the stellar rotation rate. But magnetic field itself is a, fu is a function of omega, of the rotation rate of the star, because there is a dynamo acting. And also the mass loss rate is a function of omega as well, because more active stars probably have a different type of winds, a stronger stronger type of wind, because winds are also an expression of magnetic activity. If we have all these equations, and some of these have been derived, others we derived in our paper, we can write that the spin-down rate, the omega over dt, is torque over moment of inertia, and moment of inertia you can take from some stellar models. And that solves the problem. Then we can evolve the whole system. I'll show you how this looks like. We go back here to a cluster of stars, basically, again, what I showed you before, the collection of rotation periods. This is mass, stellar mass, from 0.4 to 1 solar mass, at about 100 million years. So now we do all this calculation. We apply these formulae that I showed you before. Of course, it didn't show the explicit solution, but this is all behind this. And we can evolve this cluster and see how it changes in time, and I hope I can play this movie. That's what happens. You see that the rotation periods increase with time. They first increase for more massive stars, and then the end wars take up as well, and after a giga year or so, they're all converged. But they're not converged before. So what actually happens is that we have a widespread of rotation periods at younger ages in the age range that is so important for us, for planetary atmospheric scientists. Now what is behind this calculation was a wind. I didn't show you the, 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 the equations that we need, but there's a wind. And this wind, I extracted the wind for a solar mass star, and you see this, the solution here, which this is also a result of the calculations. That's how the wind should have looked like. Namely here, this is solar wind mass loss rate. This is mass loss rate versus age. Uh, 2 times 10 to minus 14 solar masses per year. That's the mass loss rate for the present day sun. And if we go through this model, we see that the solar wind was about 10 times at least stronger when the sun was at an age of a few hundred million years. But there's a big uncertainty here. And that has to do that a more rapidly rotating star has to produce a stronger wind to spin down in time, and the slow rotator has to produce a weaker wind. And so this leaves some uncertainty in the, in the evolution of a star. 
If we now translate rotation period to activity level, to X-rays or EUV, as I showed in the very first one of the first plots, then the uh, somewhat unexpected result uh, is this here. Another briefly summarized this in the morning already. This shows the extreme ultraviolet level, could also be X-rays, doesn't matter too much, it's very similar, in levels of uh, ergs per second per square centimeters. This is just after the disk phase, we let um, the star evolve, it's a solar mass star in this case. And you see, depending on whether we have a very rapidly rotating star initially, it stays at a very high activity level until a few hundred million years, almost a giga year, and then declines in activity while a slow rotator goes down immediately after uh, the disk locking phase, goes down here and then also converges to the solar level. Now there's a factor of 10 or 30 between the active and the, uh, the rapid rotator and the, the, the slow rotator in this diagram. And it really matters which path you go because the outcome is completely different and I'll show you how different it is in the next plot. These are calculations of a hydrogen envelope, and hydrogen envelopes, I, I come to that, are probably collected by planets that form in a disk. And a realistic value for, let's say, an Earth-like uh, planet, an Earth-mass planet, could be about 1% of its mass in a hydrogen envelope that is accreted from the disk, and I take that as a starting value, and I let it evolve under the irradiation of a rapidly rotating star or a slowly rotating sun, over millions of years, over a giga year actually, and just calculate the thermal losses. I, I motivated that in my first slide, thermal losses, just because the higher atmosphere gets hot. And as you see here, this slowly rotating star actually doesn't remove the, uh, the envelope at all. The rapidly rotating star removes it after a few hundred million years, just right in time to create a secondary atmosphere. While the upper solution, the slowly rotating star, never, of course, gets into a situation that the hydrogen uh, atmosphere is removed and you can evolve the planet over the habitable, uh, a habitable planet. So again, this matters a lot. Um, getting to these hydrogen atmospheres, hydrogen envelopes, they are created in protoplanetary disks, as we already heard this morning. Um, here are calculations um, of hydrogen envelope accretion in time, this is a somewhat strange plot, it's a logarithmic time axis here, 10 to the 7 years, that's the disk phase to the left of it. And here is a logarithmic axis that giving the atmospheric mass, the, the hydrogen envelope mass around, an, uh, around a planet, a core of a planet. And you see here how these lines all increase. This is for a 5 Earth mass core, a 2 Earth mass core, 1.6, 1.5, 2.1. And you see that especially for cores that grow to something like about an Earth mass in the disk, these lines go up very rapidly. They go into runaway, uh, a core, a runaway accretion of, atmospheric, of, of hydrogen gas from the disk. And that makes it, of course, very difficult to turn this planet into a habitable planet if the core grows in the, in the protoplanetary disks already. Now, at some point, the disk is removed, for example, by photoevaporation, also induced by the central X by the, the X-rays of the central star. And after removal of the uh, of the disk gas, the atmosphere feels a, a loss of pressure from the outside, so it expands, and that leads to a new atmospheric loss from from the upper uh, layers of the hydrogen envelope. And you see again how this acts here. This is again for five uh, Earth masses, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. You see how, again, on a logarithmic time axis, how the small cores immediately lose their entire hydrogen envelopes, while the more massive cores are not able to lose those, core, uh, those envelopes at all because of the higher gravity. But that's not the end of the story. That's only part of it. Now you add the radiation by the stellar X-rays they now also begin to act on the envelope. And now let's see what happens here. This is a, a, just an extraction of a relatively complex set of calculations we published uh, uh, some time ago, with many parameters, but let me just sort of roughly summarize what, what's seen here. 
Uh, on the x-axis, we have the initial atmosphere, the initial hydrogen envelope of different of a planet. This is a 0.5 Earth mass planet. This is a one Earth planet, and at the bottom we have a two Earth mass planet. We give initial atmospheres, and then we let them evolve under the influence of X-ray emission from the central star. And you see all these curves here, regardless of the, the very different parameters we had to assume. They all turn down, and after less than 100 million years, these envelopes are gone for low-mass planets again. For an Earth-mass planet, it really depends. Some of them turn down, some of them are stable. But the important result is as soon as you go way above one Earth mass, there's no way to get rid of the hydrogen atmospheres. And again, it's gravity. Once you have accumulated a massive hydrogen atmosphere, you cannot get rid of it, neither by release of pressure from the disk nor by X-ray and UV irradiation. They're just stuck there. These planets never become habitable. So we have a big problem with super-Earth that have become so popular recently. In fact, they, these beasts may exist. Of course, super-Earths do exist, but even those with very massive envelopes exist. This is uh, one of these traditional diagrams that show um, planet mass versus mean density of a planet measured from uh, transits and radial radi velocity. The Earth would be at one Earth mass and about five grams per cubic centimeter. That's about here. You see other planets that are sort of similar. Here are models for silicate composition, more iron here. A pure water planet would be here at this blue line. But then you see all these very low density planets down here. Super Earth with one gram per cubic centimeter mean density. These, these can only be envelope planets. They have massive envelopes. So probably these beasts actually exist. And that tells us that some of these bodies formed in the disk because that's the only way they can get their envelopes. And they will, not, they will never change. They will be stuck there. They will not lose their envelopes in the whole lifetime of a, of a star. Okay, uh, I promised to also say something about non-thermal losses. Now, winds, of course, come into the game. You see the wind here. And what we are confronted with are planets with uh, magnetospheres or without magnetospheres. But in any case, there is an obstacle here that is now um, exposed to the wind action, the ionized wind. And of course, also coronal mass ejections, you see some of them there um, acting, these uh, irregular um, explosions that you see here as coronal mass ejections. They also act like a wind. If you have many of them, they are superimposed, and they look like an enhanced wind. Now, there are different things happening if you um, expose an upper atmosphere of a planet to, to a solar wind. For example, and that's probably the most important process, there are solar wind ions coming in. There are neutrals from the planetary atmosphere moving up, and they may charge exchange at uh, some distance from the planet. The result will be that the neutral atmospheric particle becomes an ion, and ions are driven away by the magnetic and electric fields of the wind, of the solar wind or the stellar wind. The other particle, the solar wind ion, becomes a neutral, but a very high energy neutral, because it keeps the energy from the, from the former ion. And that usually flies away. It can also actually penetrate into the atmosphere of the planet and contribute to the heating of the atmosphere. But most of them just getting lost. So net, in an, as a net effect, we lose, we lose particles here from the planet. And that's a very important process. So we can now ask the question, maybe that helps getting rid of those initial envelopes that we don't want to have for a habitable planet. But calculations that were done by uh, Kislyakova and others a couple of years ago indeed show that whatever assumptions you make for a habitable zone, even for M dwarfs like in this case, it's only about 10 to 30 percent as effective as thermal losses. So we Actually, it doesn't help to get rid of the envelopes of a, of a super-Earth. But at some point, we want to, if we get successfully lose those envelopes, or we don't even build them up because they, the, the core, the planetary core, may evolve after the disk phase, at some point we will form real atmospheres, secondary atmospheres made perhaps of nitrogen or whatever else. 
And then we have to deal with the same question again. We don't want to lose those atmospheres. Those atmospheres we want to keep. But there's still the X-ray evolution of the central star, of course, going on. These are calculations now uh, where we use the pure nitrogen atmosphere. Um, these are other calculations by Feng Tian and others published quite a while ago. You see atmospheric profiles, altitude and here temperature for different irradiation levels from the sun or from the central star. One times the present day sun, three times, five times. I see how these curves go to higher and higher temperatures and eventually they even uh, in, uh, revert here. That's indicating uh, hydrodynamic expansion, there's a flow of the atmosphere actually moving away from the planet up here. Now the big problem is if the um, exobase, that's the level where the atmosphere becomes collisionless and begins to interact freely with the infalling uh, solar wind or, or, or stellar wind, if the exobase gets higher and higher with increasing heating, it's actually moving up, and if it goes outside the magnetosphere, which protects the, the lower atmosphere, it goes outside and it's just wiped away. And that's a very efficient type of loss again. And nitrogen atmospheres, unfortunately, get heated up very easily. And the, uh, if we do some calculations, just taking a, a nitrogen atmosphere, using present-day solar wind, um, and the magnetosphere that's more or less uh, realistic. Then we see as we go up with the, with the XUV level in the first 10 or 100 million years from 7 to 10 to 20 times, which may well be realistic, you see that we lose bars of atmospheres, of nitrogen atmospheres. It's really very heavy uh, mass loss of nitrogen atmospheres. So here we have the problem that we also lose nitrogen. We wanted to lose hydrogen, but now we lose nitrogen as well. And that's, of course, bad news for a habitable planet. The solution, well, there are all the solutions if there's a problem. The solution is to add CO2. And this sort of is evidence why we had to have a CO2 atmosphere on the, on the young Earth, at least if the sun was not extremely inactive. If you add CO2, this is a somewhat complex diagram. This is age here, 0.2 giga years, 1 giga years, 5 giga years. This is just radii in units of Earth radii. You see the magnetosphere moving up. That has to do with the decreasing wind pressure, solar wind pressure. But at the same time, you see what the exobase would have been for a, a nitrogen atmosphere. This was very high because it was heated when the sun was young. So the exobase of the, of the atmosphere was very high, it was above the magnetosphere. And by just adding CO2, CO2 cools very efficiently, we move the exobase down to below the uh, magnetospheric level. So this is evidence why we should have had a CO2 atmosphere, otherwise we would have a problem. We can go on with this calculation. This was just recently published by, by the same people, uh, Lichtenecker and others. Um, in a more realistic calculation where there was an H2O atmosphere and a CO2 atmosphere um, for Venus and a moderate ir irradiation by uh, XUV and X-rays. The calculation then calculates the uh, H2O dissociation escape, also oxygen escape. And if you do these calculations, you can actually see easily the initial values are shown here in bars, initial pressure of oxygen, CO2, hydrogen. Of course, oxygen and hydrogen came from photodissociation of water that we assumed initially. You see that CO2 is kept on Venus because it's a very heavy and cooling gas, but hydrogen is lost because it goes very high. The exabase of hydrogen is very high. It's lost, oxygen is dragged away and will be lost eventually as well. So this is sort of an explanation uh, we can go into now to s explain why, why Venus doesn't have water but has a very dense CO2 atmosphere. Of course, this is only the beginning of calculations. This is, this is just the start of, of more simulations. I want to skip in the interest of time. I want to skip the next example for Mars. Let me just add this as a final important point. Um, I talk a lot about X-rays and UV. I should also talk about the stellar bolometric light as a whole. And of course, as we know, stars evolve. 
initially as a, pro, as a, a pre-main sequence T Tauri star. They come down in luminosity. This is just actually the solar uh, evolution, so one solar mass. They come down 10 mega years, and they settle on the main sequence, and they stay stable for a very long time, five giga years, and then actually the sun gets slightly brighter uh, a little bit already since the zero H main sequence phase, and it gets brighter again. Now this is sort of okay, there's not much variation even in the pre-main sequence, but this is now done, this is the same now for all sorts of stars. Again, we have an F-type star, an F5, this is the solar path I showed before, but then we go down to low mass stars, an M5, an M8 star, eight M dwarfs. And here you see a very, very different development. An M star actually comes down the Hayashi track in luminosity by two orders of magnitude in a matter of about one giga year. Now imagine you have a planet that wants to be habitable. Of course they evolve in a, in a matter of a hundred million years. They are formed and they build, they build atmospheres. Here's the habitable zone of the young M dwarf. It's far away because the young M dwarf is luminous. The uh, habitable zone has to be far away. Here's our planet. This planet is overheated. <laughs> it's too close. It's too close to the star. It's not a habitable zone. But later, the, the habitable zone shrinks because of this decrease of the bolometric luminosity, and suddenly the planet is inside the habitable zone. But that's a problem, because in, the, in a matter of this one giga year, most of the water of the planet may have been <laughs> lost. And this is what these calculations show. Because of the greenhouse effect, you lose water, you photo dissociate it, hydrogen goes away. So you need to have a lot of water reservoir in an M dwarf planet in the eventually habitable zone to actually keep some of it to the end of the evolution. You need hundreds to thousands of Earth oceans of water to make this possible. Um, I skipped this perhaps as well. This is a similar calculation by Tian and Ida. They show about the same effect here, including X-ray and UV radiation. Um, essentially what they say, if you do this for a G star, which evolves rapidly and doesn't have much of a change, you can keep a lot of water in a statistical um, population synthesis. Many of these planets keep their water. In M dwarfs, you either, that's this diagram up here, you either lose all the water, as I said before, or if you have really big massive oceans at the beginning, you can keep it, but then you still have a lot of water in the end. Good, um, my conclusions, it does matter how the star evolves and how it actually what the initial conditions of the star are. That's very important to, to investigate, to, to develop a planet, to make it habitable in the end. It's also an advantage because nature adds flexibility. There's not only one path of a star and a planet to make the planet habitable. There are, there are lots of options. And this option adds freedom. And we don't know which option is the right one to make a habitable planet. This is still research to be done. Um, radiative and wind evolution matters. And of course, we've seen the problems with, with M dwarfs because of their very slow evolution. Before I completely stop, I want to advertise an event where I hope to see all of you we are organizing in Vienna, as you should probably know, in 2018, the next General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union. And I hope I will see many of you there, and I hope there will be symposia and, uh, and focused meetings on the subject that we have been discussing here. Thank you very much.